Hello and welcome to another episode of History, Myth and Legend. The Elements In this episode I will speak of one of the mysteries that occupied the minds of sages and wizards, alchemists and physicians, monks and philosophers for many an age. I will start far away from its known origins and first take you into 1624 France. The month was August and Etienne de Clave, a rising chemist, woke up having no idea that his day would end not in glory, as he expected, but with him publicly shamed, arrested among his peers and placed behind bars. His crime, heresy. The curious thing is that the club's ideas did not concern or claim to contradict the Holy Scripture, nor were they of political nature. They did not even challenge the place of man in the universe as Galileo was doing so boldly at the time. Absurd as it may seem, Etienne de Clave's crime concerned the elements and what he believed and professed about them. He had complete confidence that all substances were composed of two elements, this being water and earth, that then combined themselves with three fundamental substances or principles, namely mercury, sulfur and salt. But there was something odd about the whole affair. This was not a new idea, not even in his country. For instance, the renowned French pharmacist Jean Begin had already published his Thyrosinium Chimicum, the chemical beginner, in 1610, one of the very first chemistry textbooks. In it, Began proposed that all matter had essentially those same five basic ingredients. He died ten years later and four years before Etienne's arrest, still believing in his idea. However, the lack of originality did not save Etienne de Clave from his fate. His idea was nonetheless fiercely opposed by the powers that be, namely the Church, because it contradicted the system of elements long established by the ancient Greeks and taught by Aristotle, that at the time was their most influential philosopher. As a side note, Aristotle was also not the creator of this concept, for he learned it from his teacher Plato, who in turn learned it from Empedocles a prominent philosopher from Athens, a man who lived and experienced the golden age of Periclean democracy. So the problem resided in the fact that, while Etienne proposed a two elements and three agents path to the base of all things, Empedocles, therefore Aristotle, taught that there were four elements, not two, and they were earth, air, fire and water. But things are rarely as they seem. And the conviction of Etienne had deeper roots that require a wider perspective to be understood. But we will look at them later, when I speak of Thales of Miletus. For now, it shall suffice that Rome, then already a mere shadow of what it once was, finally fell under the name of the Byzantine Empire. The year was 1453. This caused a feeling of academical and spiritual insecurity. Too much had happened in too little time, as the medieval West emerged from the trauma of the Dark Ages. The powers that be wished to reinstitute the same security, the same unquestionable authority their wars and decrees once had. One of the solutions found was to use the never lost reverence for the scholars of antiquity, and so they were revived as the teachings of a few old sages were incorporated in the doctrines of Christianity. Therefore, in one of the many maneuvers from the Church to retain its hard conquered power over thoughts of novelty, the works of Aristotle and of many other of the great philosophers of old were given the status of God's words and thus unquestionable, beyond comprehension, irreversible and eternal. Etienne's impertinence to question Empedocles, and therefore Aristotle, was to question the word of God itself, thus incurring into the punishable crime of blasphemy. But there is more to this, since, as we already established, Etienne was not the first to speak of these revolutionary ideas, so why did he got arrested when others were not? 
it seems that it was a question of time, place, and necessity. The work of Jean Begin had already steered the waters, but perhaps, due to his many other uses and services, his heresy was overlooked. But Etienne was a sign that Jean Begin's ideas were evolving and gaining strength and followers. Etienne did not limit himself to write a book. He was gaining supporters and organizing sessions of discussion to spread his ideas among the elites and gentlemen clubs. He was arrested before one of those meetings. This time, it was to happen at a Parisian nobleman's house. His name was François de Soucy. It never came to be, for it was prevented from happening by nothing less than a parliamentary order leading to the arrest of Etienne as the leader of a corrupt group of false intellectuals. This was a time when alchemy was already well established, but with the emergence of the materialists, it became an academic taboo and it was relegated into fantasy and occultism by them. This was partly the result of the work developed by Pierre Gassendi, whose vision of a mechanical world of atoms in motion quickly became one of the strongest challenges to the Aristotelian dogma. Because of this, there were some that applauded Etienne's arrest. Caselli's fellow mechanist, Marine Mersane, that was otherwise considered a progressive thinker, endorsed his condemnation in 1624, stating for all who could listen that such gatherings encouraged the propagation of alchemical ideas. Alchemy, however, had plenty more to say about the elements. And in many ways, it was a more enticing way of looking into this problem. But that will be for a future presentation. These were very different times. Most of the visible power was still within the church and every and all were under the judgment and sentence of its agents and many informers. As such, the claws of the Holy Church were buried deep into all matters of state and public life, morphing culture and science to their own agenda. The use of law representatives to enforce a religious status quo most certainly demonstrates that. To the likeness of Galileo's future trial, this was not a question of science or truth, but a demonstration of power. Free scientific thinking was not allowed then and is still certainly not allowed now. Only then it was the church, then the state, and finally, since the 19th century, Science censors itself in the same desperate fight against change and novelty. However, and quite ironically, being free of such constraints, the ancient Greeks did not consider the elements as a case closed, even if that very same limited notion is still taught to students all over the world. This was showed by Konrad Jessner, a 16th century Swiss physician and naturalist that is best known for his systematic compilations of information on animals and plants. He stated that even in the time of Aristotle, there were at least eight systems of elements that were discussed from the epoch of tiles in the beginning of the 6th century to Empedocles. But enough of history for now. Let's dive into the question of what are the elements after all. Or perhaps, in order to simplify it in a notch, what are things made from? For most, Agreeing or not with the current academic views, the creation of the chemistry periodic table has answered that question. To them, those are the elements. Not one or four, but about 92 that have been identified as natural. But I ask, do these 92 elements really answer the question, what are things made from? Is it really possible to answer this question? Or is it as difficult as the eternal riddle about the meaning of life? Would we not find smaller and smaller particles as we dig into the very matrix of matter, indifferently to which one of the 92 elements we look upon? Will the search for the infinitely small prove us with an answer, or were our distant Hellenic ancestors obviously following on even older teachings and oral transmitted wisdom closer to the truth than science ever was or is, if no alternative thoughts are included? Could it be that although the scientific findings are relevant and important 
for our understanding of this reality as we experience it, they will end up in a vortex of fractal ramification over never-ending rabbit holes, forever locked in the never-ending Mandelbrot set. As in many other subjects, I believe that the actual answers will be found amidst the blending of disciplines, some scientific, other metaphysical, that by combining these two, we'll finally move into a new age of understanding and evolution. Does the periodic table really invalidate the teachings of Aristotle? Before my own conclusion, let's look at some other schools of thought. Sales of Miletus was one of the first known individuals that we have records of to inquire into the building blocks of the physical world. He proposed only one fundamental substance that to him was water. Many believe that his basis was the fact that so many myths relate the making of the world from a primordial lake or ocean. However, his school, that answered by the name of the Milesian school of philosophers, failed to produce any consensus about what is called as the Ihe Prole Haile, or in our tongue, first matter, the element that was at the base of everything. Anaximander, perhaps the most preeminent successor of Thales, tried to end the dissension by contending that all things are ultimately made of a substance known as a Pyrian, a world meaning indefinite. This because it could morph according to its needs in order to become any substance or matter. He believed that change came about through the action of opposites, hot and cold, dry and moist. Anaximenes was highly regarded and also one to have come from the school of Thales and his Milesian philosophers. He decided that air was primary and at the base of all things. Heraclitus, another great among the Greek pre-Socratic philosophers, natural of the city of Ephesus, that during his time was part of the Persian Empire, wrote a single work of which only fragments have riches. For him, fire, not water, not Apirian, was the prima matter of creation. Fire was at the root of all creation. For many years now, we have been told by academics that what all of these men were looking for was unity, to create an elemental particle in order to produce a simpler and less puzzling description of the world. I concord that all these sages of old were searching for a way to reduce the complexity of existence by finding what is known as prima matter. But there is another way to look at this, for there was a very good reason for them to be looking for roots and beginnings. They were looking for change, or better said, to discover how these fundamental elements aggregate, divide, and thus create all things. They saw and marveled, observing the various states of water and how it morphs and transmutates when jumping states this depending on the conditions applied. How the same fire melted metal, produced glass from sand, and reduced wood to ashes. How food was ingested, and most of them was somehow spirited away. So they were rightfully asking, if one material can become another material, aren't all materials coming from the same source? Different manifestation of different states of matter? Answering this question would be to understand the world and its changes. Empedocles is the first we have record of, though even by him this was a much older concept. He was not what we imagine when thinking of a Greek philosopher. He was described as a magician or wizard of sorts, a miracle worker who could bring back the dead. There are legends speaking of his death, and in the very least they show how unusual, let's put it that way, a man he was. He was nonetheless the father of the four elements. To his mind, change came from strife among the elements, and love caused their aggregation or mixture. Presumably, he died by leaping into the mouth of Mount Etna, intending to prove once and for all that he was an immortal god. He was short of the mark, for no one saw him ever again, having himself become one with the elements through the actions of fire. Aristotle, although promoted by the Church as speaking the word of God, by the citation of Empedocles for elements, sought the Church decided to omit 
and withhold. For Aristotle also spoke of his belief that ultimately there was only one primal substance, but that it was foolish to pursue it, since it was beyond human comprehension, therefore unsuitable to serve as the basis for a philosophy of matter. This is why he accepted and preached it Empedocles element as a kind of intermediary between the unobtainable and the tangible, testable world. Leucippus of Miletus is generally considered the one behind the concept of atoms, thinking that all things were made of one primordial substance. As for the name atom, we are told it comes from Democritus, disciple of Leucippus, and that he chose the name because it meant uncuttable or indivisible. It was him that placed the atoms as those that, depending on their arrangement and disposition, could vary their properties. According to him, fire atoms were different in the sense that they could not be mixed with other primal elements, and that these other three were combined in different amounts and thus condensed into different materials and shapes with physical properties, while fire was not. He defended that his atoms existed in a void-like dimension, and this has separated him and his followers from the other philosophies of matter, since its oppositors contended that there is no such thing as the void or nothingness, replying authoritatively that the elements must completely fill all existing space. For instance, Anaxagoras, the mentor of Pericles and Euripides, taught that there was no limit to how small a particle may become, that matter was ever divisible, and thus all space was filled with them. This meant that tiny grains would fill up all the nooks between larger grains, like sand between stones. Aristotle, neglecting that the air itself was made of atoms, perhaps on purpose or out of ignorance, claimed that air would fill any void between atoms. Plato, that was not a follower of Democritus, went as far as to give shape to the four Empedoclean elements. His geometrical perspective over all things led him to say that these particles had identifiable, measurable, mathematical shapes. These ideas gave origin to the polyhedra we know as the regular platonic solids. Earth was a cube, air an octahedron, fire a tetrahedron, and water, an isocahedron. Each one of the flat faces of these shapes originate from two kinds of triangles that he professed as the true fundamental particles of nature. Not only this, but also that they spread through every bit of space. Under this line of thought, the elements created matter of all sorts by rearranging the triangles into new geometric forms. But Plato did not stop there. He had also foreseen a fifth element that he envisioned as the fifth platonic regular solid, the dodecahedron, that is formed by pentagonal faces. By realizing that this was a shape that could not be recreated by rearranging the triangles of the other four elements, Plato assigned it to the heavens. The Church decided to keep this fifth classical element well within their library doors. However, to the likeness of Aristotle, Plato considered it inaccessible to mortal beings, and one who played no part in the physical world matrix. It is at this point relevant to mention what this really means, is that the classical elements are not representatives of all things specifically, but rather a global and more abstract inclusion of different physical states of matter. As such, we find Earth represents all solids, Water is the archetype of all liquids, air obviously of all gases and vapors. As for fire, things are somewhat different. This because this element has no physical form and yet is visible, as if made of light, being but a variable combination of substances in a specific and uncommon state that results from a chemical reaction that had specific colors according to the type of matter that was being burned. This leads us nicely into the next part. Later on, many other characteristics were added, and so the five elements gained color. Leon Battista Alberti, a Renaissance artist, linked red to fire 
blue to air, green to water, and cinareum that was an ash-like color to earth. This was later changed by Leonardo da Vinci that made earth yellow instead. Many painters took this to heart, following these principles as a guide on how to mix and use colors, and so this code got embedded into many of the works of art we admire today and providing a new layer of significance. To the likeness of colors, the elements were also associated with the four points of the compass, as we find in the Chinese tradition acknowledging five elements and their analogous five directions. But they did not stop there, and thus we also find the four humors as being the cornerstone of classical medicine. Galen, a Greek physician, believed that our health depends on the balance of these four essences, red blood, white phlegm, and black and yellow bile. All this led into an alchemy frenzy and a general medieval obsession with correspondences among the characteristics and creations within nature. I consider an important part of this discussion to realize that these wise men of old understood that wood was not simply wood, stone was not just a stone, that metal, like all other previously mentioned, was more than just what is revealed to our senses of sight and touch. They had the insight that things are not as they look, but a manifestation of other forces that were locked into that form, and that this form was not definite in any way, for they could be worked, combined, and reshaped at will. This, once the secrets of the crafts required for that effect were known and perfected. I cannot say, but to me, air, water, fire, earth, and let's not forget the fifth element, the ether, are the tangible source of all things, for they have the ability to create, to change, to morph and destroy every and all. For it to be so, we also need to include time, but not as an element, but as a dimension. Combined, they have created all that we see in the universe and perhaps in the multiverse itself. Imagine a Lego set. Many pieces, different colors and size, different anchoring points and joints, some mobile, others stationary. So I will leave you with two questions. Are these the elements, or are the real elements the forces that combine the particles that made and locked the shape of the legal pieces? Are the elements particles or forces? Thank you all for staying this long. Please like, subscribe and share. All comments are welcomed. My name is Ricardo Calvario and you have been watching History, Myth and Legend.